entire school and island is actually the sticks. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's absolutely no grass in there. Yeah, so and before that, Kevin was working for about two, three years in KPMG. So, so I mean, actually, I wanted to actually be a participant, uh, but it wasn't teacher major when I was thinking about it. So uh, a colleague of mine here said, let's start up teacher major. Um, so then I had to be on the management team, and all others are missing it to Um For today, I know the talk is about a very broad topic about education in the major to apply. Uh, like maybe just hear a few questions from you guys. Like what, is, what do you guys want to take away from this? And what are some of your questions in the back of your mind? Um, that you're keen to learn more about, so I'll make sure we cover those topics just in a brief introduction. Um, so you know that the education syllabus in Malaysia goes under constant rehauling every couple of years. I mean, what do you guys think about that? What kind of challenges do, do those um, changes give to your organization as well as the people in your organization that you want to teach? So this How can we make a difference in for the education and for the sake of the future generation in Malaysia as you know the intellectuals for that to Malaysia in the future? Great question. Mm -hmm. yep. So could, could you um so we just introduce your names as well, thank you. Just before so that yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Hannah, I'm from Darwin College. Hannah Armin, asking about syllabus. Cindy. Cindy asking about what to do. Uh, I'm Sarah from Christ College. So your name? Um, Samuel. 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 Um, how do you see yourself integrating with the various streams of uh, education in Malaysia? Do you, uh, do you see people, the Chinese group, and then the mainstream um, uh, education system? Integrating in terms of the unified Chinese school system? Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you see yourself fitting in the, the, the bigger picture of uh, where you're swapping? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I probably question for the first is this a sustainable program? I mean, are, are we like planning for PFM to exist for like 100 years or why is it like, yes. I mean, we are building up the human resource to change the education system. Very question. Okay. I think we'll just stop there and we'll, we'll talk for a bit as well when we cover some parts. I got one question for you guys, maybe a show of hands as well. Uh, but we'll have more questions later on. Uh, show of hands, uh, how many of you have actually uh, read the blueprint? And so I'm proud of okay, nine or ten of them. Okay. So about ten of you guys. Um, so I'm gonna start off by just talking about some key facts in the blueprint as well. Uh, just so that I want to Um and these are the facts that I think I think is a bit more relevant to the work that we're trying to do in teaching major. Our belief is that a child's background should not determine someone's future. If you're born in Kolkata, or you're born in Klang, or you're born in uh, Kota Kumune, all in the same area, and you have very different life opportunities. Now, the first point that I'm going to share is actually the Ministry of Education called out uh, and benchmarked our system against PISA. Have you guys, have you guys heard of PISA? Uh, you know it's being organized by OECD. OECD is basically a sense of Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's considered the rich economy club. A um, couple of rich economies got together and, and then part of that has an education arm. So this PISA, they then did an assessment in terms of measuring uh, student performance in their own systems. So if you're in DM, in Malaysia, it's all, the tests are all done in DM. Uh, if you're in China, it's all in Mandarin, etc. So it all measures uh, write, uh, writing, maths, and science. Right? And this test so far is meant to be a lot more um, advanced because it goes into higher order thinking. So in that is considered like analyzing, uh, constructing your own material, synthesizing materials as well, compared to just regurgitating. Um, previous tests were doing that. So that's why PISA is seen to be the gold standard of tests at the moment. The 
it's, and the assessments are also really, really critical as well because sometimes you can't even, what's important can't really be measured, right? Um, in terms of love for learning, ambition, uh, confidence of the kid, problem solving skills. Those are very hard skills to actually measure. So they're trying to actually, PISA's trying to create these measurements, standardized tools across the world in terms of learning. In fact, which are countries that are performing the best? And then they zoom in and they try to learn which, what are the best, best practices that create that opportunity. So Malaysia, for the first time in its ever national movement, etc., um, actually called out any international benchmark and set a goal. No longer was the goal looking inwards, Malaysia started looking outwards. So that's point number one. Point number two, Malaysia system of then we then introduced a school ranking system. So all 10,000 schools were ranked. Again, from the assessments and in education as well, you can't, how do you actually say an A is an A and this kid is actually going to be performing? So there's a lot of controversies around rankings, but it's better not to have any rankings then, in my view. That it's better to have a ranking of 10,000 schools and you know which are the best schools and which are the low performing schools, not to judge the schools, but then to support them to perform. Um, this was never done before in the Malaysian system on a national basis. Um, and this is important because it then creates a performance culture at a school level. Can you imagine a system or a group of education or a group of any organization, uh, let's say you're making cars, right? And you can't measure which car is more profitable, which cars produce faster. Um, and those are like the tangible outcomes in the business side, but the education side, they, they, they are lacking these tools. So you can't identify which one of the best practices and which one, which uh, schools are not performing. So you got the, all the 10,000 schools all ranked, point number two, never before. They are going to move these rankings into individual teachers. I hope um, it happens, but it's, it's just in the process right now. So right now, teachers are also ranked based on observations. So Ken May might be a school inspector, an independent monkey will come and observe me as a teacher, and he'll rank me based on my actions. But is a uh, student outcomes actually taken into consideration? That's most of the time it's only about 20 or 30 percent, a very small factor. Um, so you're ranking or you're rating your teachers not on this, based on the delivery but not on the outcome. That sense. Um, Point number three I wanted to share is that actually um, all of these are all of these are in this blueprint and I just wanted to bring it up. What you actually find is that from the rankings you've got seven bands. Okay? From the seven bands, band seven being the lowest, um, fifty percent of the students that go to this band six and seven schools need um, in the primary level need food assistance. So they call it a band one one. Okay. There's, a, there's lots of acronyms, but it's food assistance basically, right, for sure. Uh, so you actually see, this food assistance is given based on socioeconomic background. So you actually see there's a strong correlation between the uh, children's background and the performance in the school level. So point number three. The fourth point I'm going to share is that actually almost 87, so almost 95% of the students in Malaysia actually go and are in the government system. It's probably about 15% that go to either uh, the UEC, private schools, international schools, etc. So there's still a, sorry, 95, that means there's 5% there. I left engineering in a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you see actually, there's actually a bigger system that happens. And what that tells me is that if 95% of the students are in the system, uh, therefore more effort needs to be put into the system. There's always an argument to be made like, oh, you can show examples of success outside and then try to implement it or try to transfer it in. But the resistance, oh, this is where the politics comes in. And I don't mean politics from the uh, BN or PR sort of politics, right? Those politics are, I think, easier compared to the politics in education between educationists. If something's happening really great outside of the system, the people in the system will say, of course they can do that. They have the resources, they have the uh, they have the budget, they have small school sizes, and so there's all sorts of reasons that come in to why, why it succeeded outside and why it can't be placed on the inside. These are just regular people coming up with regular excuses about why they're not going to perform. So I, I call that politics in that sense of the egos, driven by egos, etc. 
Now, that to me is the most dangerous part because then, and that's why also teach major is something that I really enjoy or really like, and also the teach first program in the UK, teach America, because it's actually trying to create change from the inside. Um, now that's the broad overview of the blueprint. Um, there are problems which the blueprint then dives into a lot deeper. I probably want to just take a few seconds or so for us can make to share some of the challenges he has seen in terms of the students that he's uh, taught as well as drawn his three years. So I, I taught in a school, uh, put up the time as, as much earlier, which is actually a little, it's like an island, uh, almost like its own country, where they don't really listen to like local news. Uh, in former geography, I asked one of my students who do you think the majority of race in Malaysia, and then she said Chinese. Uh, then I said, okay, you didn't really go to like the mainland. So they're really secluded in that sense. Um, being secluded is only one part of it. So the students I taught, I taught form two and form three students, right? Um, and them failing the exam was only was only the beginning, right? Because when, when a student fails an exam, they think like, okay, let's work with this, right? So they, I had a student that got like 11 out of 100 for his English test. So I'm wondering, okay, 11, okay, I can work with that, I can make it like 30 or 40 or 50, right? But what I found out out of that 11, eight of them was from MCQs and they just like, you know, the word came back. So they actually, the, the level of English for this particular student, his name is Yong Hao, his, his level of English is actually at preschool because I did phonics with him and he doesn't know how to pronounce the tongues, right? Um, and a lot of the students, for instance in my school, which I think is it's quite similar to a lot of other fellow schools as well, um, a lot of the students that come from primary school, like from my, my school, 70% of the students that come from primary school go into remove class. So they fail the end, uh, then they fail English or another subject. Uh, so in that sense, my main struggle is basically, you know, it's always the, it's kind of like trying to figure out where the problem is, so I say like, okay, primary school doing something wrong. So then I go and talk to the primary school teachers, and the primary school said, you know, the parents are doing something wrong, and it was somebody else, right? Um, and even within the system, I think one major challenge that we did have, because um, as a fellow in the school, we want to do a lot of things, have a lot of impact in our classroom. Um, but there's a lot of, of layers in the system. Right? There's a lot of people above you that, that give directives into the school, uh, which kind of restrict like the school's independence and how they, because they, they know what's best for their students in that sense. And we may not know what's best, but they know uh, what the issues for their students. But they keep receiving directives. So I think that was, I um, would say, one of the major challenges. Um, so you have that how old? Yeah, my kid? Yeah, this is your remote class, is 15 uh, in form 2. So 15 form 2, we did the preschool. <coughs> so he was reading, he was reading, at, uh, we did a San Diego quick test, and he was at grade 1. Uh, which in, in the US is actually like, like standard one with kind of level. So I think then we'll just uh, quickly build on some of the questions that was brought up as well. In terms of what does Teach Major see itself? Um, is it sustainable in the long run? No. Uh, we aim to shut down by 2025. Uh, that the whole idea is that we pegged it with the blueprint as well. So the blueprint has is going through a tremendous transformation change. Someone asked what initiatives are we advocating for? I think, I think it was you, right? No, someone else. Who, who asked about the ad policies that we're advocating for? Uh, yeah, policies, yeah. Okay, so the policies that we're advocating for is actually measuring teacher performance uh, based on student outcomes. Uh, we're also measuring, we're also pushing for fast track career progressions. We're pushing for greater autonomy to schools, and what can we mention? A lot more decentralization, especially when it comes to talent. A lot of them, the principal is just given a teacher. The principal didn't interview, didn't do anything with that. Can you imagine if you suddenly had, if, if you guys as a committee, right, suddenly just had a, uh, sorry, you guys as a society just had a committee that just showed up and you had no say about how are you going to drive performance in that sense. Uh, we're also then advocating a lot for. Um, uh, to move, the autonomy needs to be given as a means towards achieving performance, not as a reward for performance, which is happening right now. So, of those band one schools that I talked about, once they reach that level, only then they're given autonomy. It's a lot of great things to do. But you don't need it by that point. You actually need it when you're stuck down here. And how do you then build up across that? So, we, we think we, if we focus on these three uh, mechanisms that's around talent and around creating a culture of performance, uh, we hope um, the two-year experience that fellows go through, more of them will choose to stay on as alumni in the system. 
uh, we got already some positive uh, news in the sense that nine out of the first 50, or 50 started, 44 completed, and nine actually stayed on in the system to teach. Uh, so we then tried to work ways of to fast track them. Eventually, I hope one of them will eventually become the Director General of the Ministry of Education, if not from the first cohort, the second cohort. From the 44, nine stayed on to teach. Two plus one, um, I would say plus one, uh, because he's interviewing for a job. So the blueprint right now is being implemented by Padu. Have you heard of Padu before? Pumandu? Pumandu, yeah? So Pumandu, Padu is the smaller cousin of Pumandu, of Pumandu specifically <coughs> to implement the blueprint. And Padu is very, doesn't have a celebrity CEO like it is Jala, uh, hence the lack of like, publicity. But this unit is going to be the project management unit to coordinate all this. So two alumni joined them already, and one more is interviewing. Uh, the remaining 15, or uh, another 15, teach major actually absorbed into our organization. So roles like campaign, in talent acquisition, in program, to do the training, in fundraising, in government relations. Because we're just now third, in our third year, uh, but no one on, on the team has actually done the program before. So we needed to build that in. But in the long run, we definitely want to shut down and therefore uh, have 25. Hopefully then PISA rankings are somewhere close to the top. Uh, coming to your question, Hannah, about syllabus changes happens all the time. I think it's going to happen and it's not something that we can control or stop. Because I think as long as the syllabus change is for the good. Um, what's happening right now is a school-based assessment program uh, called PBS. Big hoo-ha happening. Uh, you want to share a bit about the challenges? So, uh, here is a really interesting system. Uh, anybody heard of it before? Yeah. yeah, you heard of it? So basically, it's it's giving us money to school to assess their students. So they try to do away with PMR. Right? So at first glance, you're like, okay, do away with PMR means what? Um, so it means that in the class, teachers will actually assess based on certain skills. So for instance, I teach English, I have a few skills to assess. Um, student will be able to uh, public speak on the topic, so and so. Right, so you have to assess them. Um, so there, there are a lot of issues towards that because subjectivity is a really big thing. Right? If you're in a band one school and you're in a band six school, uh, public speaking would look very, very different. Um, and, and there's that as well. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges was the implementation of the system, which actually really, really, um, to me, kind of kind of resulted in why it is right now. Okay? So when, when they first implemented it, they brought it in like in the middle of the year, somewhere around April or May. Right? Uh, we'd already won three months, this was in my first year teaching, three months in, and then they reintroduced an entire new system. Um, so they said, well, you have to either catch up you know, the past three or four months you've been teaching, or use the, the exercises that you've been teaching to put into the PBS. Right? Um, and it was a very new thing for a lot of teachers. Um, and then came another system, which you have to key in all your online uh, like information, which for me is ideal, is ideal if everything is online, Students can see their performance, parents can see their performance, it's actually really good. Right? The only problem was that system, that server. Um, so there was reports in the newspaper and all sorts of teachers complaining that they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I personally had 4 or 5 straight sleepless nights to try to stay awake to key the system, and so we were, um, no lag, like, so you click in the newspaper, you turn, you turn, you turn. <laughs> and just turn to the morning, and then suddenly came out there, I'm just like, um, so it was, it was actually really difficult and very stressful for a lot of teachers because they're, they're used to paperwork but at the same time there was a system to key in marks um, and they thought it would be similar to that, that system was worked, was worked over many years. So this new system, and currently, just, just last week, they announced that they're going to review this system because of all the complaints they're receiving. So I think like when we spoke to, we had the head of, um, what's his name, the Lombarda for Brixa and the, 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 the examination board, uh, speak to us about why they implemented this system. Right. They've been thinking about it for a really long time. Uh, they said, you know, it's 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 long coming already, and it's actually important um, because they're benchmarking it against other countries, uh, countries that use this kind of systems, which I thought was actually really good. Just the implementation was a really really big challenge there, um, and that's why they're kind of reviewing it as well. Yeah. And also, uh, while a lot of thought was put in, there's a lot of challenges in the implementation. All this could be planned out a bit better. Uh, someone told me that Singapore being the top three or top four countries or so in PISA, said their teachers were not ready to implement PBS or school-based assessment. So uh, that, I was, when I got that, I was like, like what? Then how did we come to that conclusion? You know, like, we don't know where this thing's coming from. 
Uh, ideally, it's, the intentions are really great. They want to push students to think about higher order thinking. But again, it's the implementation and the execution. That's where a lot of things fall short. Uh, which brings me to your question, Cindy, what can you do, right? Uh, the first question I would just say, like, what do you want to do? Uh, I mean, and ask that because so that you know who you are. It's really important to pursue what you want and what you are, what drives you. Because uh, it doesn't matter if like, we can start here, like, okay, join each major, it's a leadership development program, we do it for two years, we get paid, etc., etc., and then you can continue as a alumni to change that. But if it's not for you, then there's no point. You really need to feel like you want to at least to join the major, you really have to feel like you want to actually sweat blood, cry tears, and, so, and then what else? Like, um, scratch yourself and hang yourself until like, you have sleepless nights and stuff like that. If you thought you had sleepless nights in Cambridge, it's nothing. Right? It was the sleepless nights that you'll get as a fellow. Uh, so, but if that's not for you, there's other ways for you to contribute as well. Because there's a lot of other education initiatives and programs that are happening in Malaysia. And it's just about to take off. So, Find out what you want first, and if it doesn't exist, I say create it. Right? You guys are some of the smartest and brightest kids. <coughs> I could do it. Like, I had no leadership experience, I had no management experience, I had no education experience. I was definitely not a great engineer. Uh, but when you feel that you want to do something and it doesn't exist, create it and start it up. Uh, there will be people that will be thinking about what you want to do. I say do it. Um, question at the back. I think your name was Jeff, right? Seven. Sorry. Seven. Huh? Oh, huh. Huh. Okay, sorry. For some reason I heard Jeff. <laughs> uh, sorry, Pam. Uh, so your question was about where does teaching major sit in terms of the, all the stakeholders, especially in the service. Uh, well, in my view, at least currently, uh, Teach major wants to position itself as a strategic thought partner or strategic service provider or strategic partner of any sort to the Ministry of Education. We want to be the person that brings in the talent and manages the talent at least in the first two years. Right now, this is not very consistent in terms of who recruits a teacher, who trains a teacher, and how the teacher is supported in the first two years. And because of all this mismatch, you have different people looking for different things at each stage. So Teach Major creates the opportunity for that to be a very clear stage uh, from a teacher and a talent perspective. Whether we can apply that to the independent Chinese schools, Etc. is something that we want to explore, but we're going to start probably with uh, primary schools uh, and the vernacular schools first. Uh, again, we don't want again because ninety-five percent of the students end up are in the edu current education system, so we want to focus our time on that basis. Uh, and I think the the challenges of the UEC is much larger political forces that we don't want to get involved with as well at this stage as well. At this stage, we want to demonstrate credibility. Uh, that we, we can make a difference in just two years of teaching. Uh, in that two years of teaching as well as showing like, your example of your student. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of people question what can you actually do in two years, right? Um, and you know, a lot of the argument around that is actually there's a lot more impact you do make as a man. So after the two years, you kind of get a grounding of, of what you do during the two years, you have an understanding of the problem, and actually tackle it for many years. Uh, but even within those two years, there's a lot of things that you can do. Because students are face to face every day with a system that um, is, is challenging, and it's kind of at the moment a one size fits all. So a lot of students are kind of at the edges, right? Especially in the schools that we teach in. Um, so I had one student that, uh, the one that I was talking about just now, you know how. So he started off at, you know, he got 11 over 100. So I thought, okay, so what can I do in my first year? So I was teaching him English, right? So I knew a lot of vocabulary, lots of exercises, lots of videos and stuff like that, talking to him. Um, he managed to get from an 11 to a 17. Right? And I was just like, crap, that sucks. So like, 11 to 17 is like a six point improvement. Uh, that could have been a fluke. Right? And I'm just saying to myself, okay, how effective am I as a teacher if I can't get into pass or can't get into the NA? Right? Uh, fortunately, I had, I had him in the second year as well. The problem with having him in the second year, his batch was the last batch sitting for PMR, right? So he was looking at PMR saying, teacher, there's no way I'm going to pass. Absolutely no way. I've never passed English in my life since then, too, right? Um, so what I did in my class, um, although at the back of my mind, I was, I was kind of like doubtful of it, they could, but I kind of just pushed them. So I drew them an essay. So in PMR, you have to write a 121 essay. My students were struggling with writing a sentence, right? They couldn't figure out how to put the sentence together. So I, I did very simply SVO, subject, verb, object. Um, 
one subject verb object, two subject verb object, write 10 sentences, and you have about 89 words there. All right, you work with that. So I drew, 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 drew. When you came to PMR, this particular student, Yong Hao, I'm not sure what he was doing, practicing at home, but he was very confident. So he went to the examination hall and he looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this guy is. <laughs> he, he, I don't know what he did at home, so I encouraged him all the way. Then when he came out of the exam hall, he said, like, teacher, I think I did very well. I was speaking in Chinese now. Um, and I said, okay, great, that's fantastic. Um, so I ended my fellowship, um, and I told him about the party and stuff like that. Uh, and after Christmas, somewhere around the 28th or 29th, they got the results. And I was the first person he called. He didn't even call his mom. <laughs> he called me, right? He said, oh, see, oh, see. Teacher, I got a C plus. Right? And I'm just like, oh, really? Oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, and he was really, really, really happy. Um, and of course, he, he did feel a couple of other subjects, but that kind of just proved to him what he could do. And, and he was way behind, right? And he is still behind. Um, and there's still a lot of things to do. And there's a new fellow um, that is currently teaching him as well in in, in Yorkata, and I told him about him. I told my new fellow Joshua, he's from Imperial as well. So I told him about these students, some of their positive points, some of their negative points, um, to hope that they continually get like an inspiring force to push them, right? And just a little success kind of tells them that it's possible because their whole life they kind of reinforce that it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. Yeah, and you need someone that you need, you need a teacher that. That maybe like just says, okay, even if I don't think it's possible, I'm gonna tell you this, I'm gonna show you how. Take it, yeah, take it, take it, take it, take it. Take it. <laughs> yeah, even after you set the exam, I was just like, okay, go for the best. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the key really, like with students or teachers or even anything that you do yourself, right? Set high expectations and don't never ever know it. Uh, you might fail, you might fall short, but just keep on going at it. Uh, Samuel, I forgot what your question was. Uh, it's about the brain drain and how will it affect the delivery system? Badly. Badly. I mean, brain drain is a huge problem. Um, Family Corp was set up and they're trying to solve it. Um, slightly, I don't know, I, I don't look at it as a big problem. It's going to happen anyway. And the brain drain is more of a push factor rather than a pull factor, I think, in my personal opinion. Uh, people are actually leaving the country because there's you don't have a very equitable system, you don't have a very fair system, you don't have a very transparent system. Um, and But then the, the problem is to solve it, you need to solve it with the same people that are leaving. Uh, so the same smart people actually can contribute, right? So I honestly don't know how and if it's possible to reverse the brain drain, uh, but I think at least we should just start with the classrooms. I hope that answers your question in some sense. Did I miss out on any of these questions to begin with? No, no, I was just asking if you have been there for a long time. Yeah, I think that's it. Should we open up another round of questions? Or? Yeah. Yes, sir. Two part answer. What's your name? Oh, Justin. Yeah. Justin. Um, okay. So, if there was one thing you could change to to alleviate the situation or to achieve the goals, what would it be? Um, you you can answer it in terms of your current position now, or in terms of let's say you're the, you're someone who has a higher power or something, and or maybe. Um, Forgot to say, yeah, some something like that. Oh, or whether that uh, considering all considering the current situation, all the laws and everything in place, yeah. Okay. If you want to. Um, I'm going to Emmanuel College. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what is the greatest and largest company's conception about education that you guys have realized after you guys started from the job? Have you seen that? Then you guys realize that oh, that's not what I thought before I entered the. Cool. Uh, I'm Gen Z from Churchill College. Um, I see that our education system is currently um, compared to the Singapore education system a lot. Um, do you guys think that there are certain things that we should take from their system and implement our system to make our system better? If so, what are they? I think we'll just talk about three questions first and then we'll open up so we can answer it a bit more fast. <coughs> Um, I think 
Singapore example is really great. Um, there's going to be a lot. Uh, um, there's actually uh, uh, a more performance-driven culture, and especially in terms of how you manage talent. You cannot solve this big problem without first solving your talent problem within the education space. Right now, um, this actually, I think I can answer all three at the same time. <laughs> so right now you actually think like, oh, actually there's no talented teachers or no talented people in the system. Um, and actually they are there, but it's a system that actually doesn't harness that, or doesn't bring out the most of that. The system bogs them down with a lot of paperwork, a lot of administrative burden, when education is probably the, has the best potential to motivate and inspire someone to work because it has a very high calling um, the example that Ken Ming said just now, right? The last year I got a 6 C plus, right? Like, oh wow. I mean, if you ask him, like, can that, does he get that satisfaction working in Teach Malaysia? No. Does he get that satisfaction in KPMG? Definitely not, right? But as a fellow, as a teacher, he, he had that passion, he had that reward. Um, and there are a lot of teachers that do get motivated by that reward, but the system has no clue how to harness that on a scalable basis. Singapore does a really good job at that, um, and they also move talent. For example, one of that one specific talent in this, in this is that no, like if you've been a if you're a high performing teacher for three or four years, we would let the Singapore government would then take you up, put you in the ministry, and expose you to some of the higher level policy making things first, and then after three or four more years, they then push you back into the schools. So really, you have you have a teacher or, or, or an individual or talent that can think like on both sides of the fence. You know, not just in delivering content, but in terms of how to manage as well. And that provides a then jump to so then becoming a high performing principal. So a simple uh, a basis or so like how do you get high performing principals or so like how do you manage a talent. Right now in Malaysia, to be a principal, can anyone guess how, what you need to do to be a principal? Oh. Hmm? When someone mentioned something just now. Old. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's just based on service. Right? Um, can you guess what's the average tenure of a, when someone is appointed as a principal in Malaysia? Two, three years. Okay, fine. No, years of service. Oh, I mean, two, three years. years. Yeah, from when they, from when they started. Five, years. No, no. Twenty. <laughs> so twenty years of service. Yeah. Okay. Any other guesses? 30 years of service. 30 years of service? No, that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it takes 20 years of service. Yeah. 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 It takes 23 years on average. Um, in Finland, you can be, on average, it takes about 9 years to be a principal. Mm -hmm. So, not alone Singapore, but there's a lot of other countries that actually know how to manage that talent very, very effectively. Um, so again, that would be something I wish I could change from a policy point of view. From an outcome point of view, I wish uh, I could change the fact that we, we wouldn't be able to predict a child's future based on their background. Well, I wish I could change the fact that, uh, if I ask someone this question, if any of you, when you guys have kids, would you be afraid if your kids were randomly placed in any 10,000 schools? And the answer now is like, yes, I would be afraid, right? I wish I could change that. I wish your answer would be no. That would be a desired outcome, a very tangible outcome that we can work towards. Um, another shocker um, in terms of what uh, Nick or so was that when we first started up, there was a whole um, debate about you know, local graduates are hopeless, local graduates are nonsense, etc. Um, and when we first started Teach Major, also we expected like, okay, we'll probably only get like 10, maybe 20% local graduates that would meet our selection bar. Um, but we were pleasantly surprised. We had 50% local graduates and 50% foreign graduates. There was actually no differentiator in terms of like, um, uh, like the quality that was coming up. They were there, they were just harder to find. Of course, if you come to a foreign university, you just go to the Malaysian society, all the Malaysians tend to be of the same cut. But then, if you go to a local university, where do you actually find the high performing Malaysians, there's no like unifying force or unifying group or etc. in that sense. Um, so I actually I actually worked in a, a corporate company as a recruiter and I worked in KPMG for about three two or three years before. Um, and when I first started teaching Malaysia, I mean like most of you when you first hear it like 
that's great, you know, they're doing a great thing. Um, but it wasn't something that kind of like, like, kind of hit home for me at the first first hearing about it. Um, when I actually went into it, so so going to a system, understanding that you need to to kind of like impact it means you kind of acknowledge that there's something wrong with the system, right? So what I thought is that okay, teachers are actually there's a lot of teachers that are just not doing really well, and like like Samir says, there are a lot of really good teachers, but I thought like majority of them are just not doing well. Um, and we kind of have to change that mindset going into school because you can't go into school thinking you're better. Right? You can't go into school saying like, you know, hey, I'm here. Um, so we, we worked a lot in thinking like, right, so how do we collaborate? How do we invest and how do we come alongside other teachers? When I actually went into my school, uh, there were a few really, really very good teachers. Right? They are excellent teachers. When they came in, I was just like, whoa. Um, and their classes are so invested in what they teach. They, a few of them teach science, another one teaches Chinese and art. And their kids are just like laughing, having fun. Um, and then there are other teachers, right? Um, which kind of like, you know, they're just not performing, right? Not doing, not doing their, their um, not doing their responsibilities and stuff like that. Um, and then again, my first glance, what I expected is that, you know, these are just low performing teachers, right? So that was in my first when I first came a couple of months. What I did over the two years is I got to know these teachers individually. I got to know where they're from. I got to know what, what they're doing and why they're a teacher. And a lot of them, they're there kind of because they didn't have any other option. Um, that's one thing. And another thing, because the system is so big and they place you anywhere, a lot of them in my school, particularly because we're on an island, 90% uh, of the teachers that are there are away from family. Right? Four of them are actually married, have a kid. Their kid is in Kelantan. She is over here. Husband is in Kaga. Right? And she flies back to Kelantan every weekend. And I'm just like, how do you even like bother about what's happening here? You know, when your family is spread across the entire, you know, the whole of Asia. I'm just understanding these teachers and understanding the struggles that they go through, give me motivation to actually work alongside and say, okay, if, if I make your life a little bit easier, if, if let's say we knowledge share, do things together, um, will that help? You know? And if they were placed, you know, coming back to teacher performance, if they were placed somewhere where they wanted to be and they were measured by performance. Could that actually determine how good a teacher they are, rather than just saying like, oh, there's a bunch of teachers that, that just won't make it kind of thing. Because I think within teachers as well, the reason they go into teaching, they all have, they all have that desire to impact students, right? It's just how that desire kind of pans out. Uh, and, and like I said, in the first two years of teaching, how they are supported is a big thing. Um, there were a couple of teachers that came in halfway through my first year. <coughs> And they came in, they heard a teacher from Malaysia, they came up to us and like, wow, you know, so excited, so much energy, fresh out of teaching college. And I thought like, well, this is fantastic, we're going to do heaps together, we're going to do planning and stuff, projects and all that, you know, when we teach classes together, we're going to get A's, all right? Um, so one of these teachers, within three months, he applied to leave. He applied to be transferred out because he, like, his, his face just fell, he had a culture shock. Um, it's a pure Chinese community, they're Malays. Um, you know, because you're placed in random schools, you know, all over the place, and they're just there, they don't know how to cope, and basically they just went into survival mode. No longer excellence, no longer trying to, he's a good teacher, because when he started off, you know, he came in with lots of stuff, a lot of idealism. Um, and it's actually, unfortunately, it's the system that kind of just burns that out of you. Um, and, you know, without a proper performance management system, without proper support, a lot of teachers with, with a lot of potential kind of just fizzle out. Um, and they're going to continue teaching for the rest of their life, right? And they're going to they're going to impact a lot of different students, but the kind of impact. So that, that kind of had a burden on me as well, and that's why you know when we're in school, we're kind of thinking about the teachers as well. How can we like knowledge share? How can we reduce the paperwork? You know, everybody's writing the same form ten times. I'm not sure why as well. You know, um, just trying to help each other out in that sense. Um, so that's that's one thing that I probably didn't expect when I came in. And uh, over the two years, that perception actually changed. As Are there questions? So there was something about the back because I didn't come to you. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah uh, my name is Mark. Um, Mark. This is going to take on from what you just said earlier about performance. It's going to be a bit contentious. I'm sorry, but sure. uh, the real issue here, I think, is uh, the affirmative action um, uh, with the Malays. I think. Um, do you believe, first of all, affirmative action is stifling? the education system is corrupting the education system. Second of all, how I, I know affirmative action is not going to go away. It's, ma it's making the Malays more uncompetitive. It's making education system 
rubbish and how is teaching from Malaysia going to work themselves around it uh, in terms of your efforts? Um, how are you going to drive performance among teachers? How are you going to make students more competitive? Um, yeah. Just now you were talking a lot about teachers' performance and you were fighting for um, changing the teachers' performance from delivery to student performance, am I right? Yeah, I um, just want to know a bit more detail. How are you going to gauge like, judging from student performance? Are you going to use like, summative assessments like, like PMR, SPM, that kind of thing? You know, like, how do you do it? Because like, I remember my English teacher used to say she gave up teaching English, she teaches to pass. <laughs> So, yeah, because you, you have a short time kind of thing, so things like that. Just want to know. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with the tough one. Just to hold your idea of the uh, Affirmative policies. Uh, we were pretty scared about that right? when we first started our teaching in Asia, so when one Malaysia was first introduced. So we then, someone, someone then asked us to make it teach for one Malaysia. So, <laughs> And we wanted it to be a bit broader. We wanted to make sure that we were always attract. We wanted to make sure that we always pure. We remain pure about the students that we wanted to serve, right? So we always wanted to make sure we were attractive to people from both sides of the ideology. Um, now with affirmative action, to be honest, I haven't really seen it impact teaching Asia yet, right? Uh, it, I recognize it's there, uh, and actually. Our intake, we have on average about 60 to 65 percent Chinese. Of that, maybe three, two thirds are female as well. So the biggest the biggest demographics is actually female Chinese uh, that join Teach Home Asia. We have about 30 percent Malays, and the remaining is either Indian or Danai Lai. Okay, we get this question asked quite a bit. How come there's so many Chinese people in the program? That question comes up, and it's a and it's a and that question is a reflection of the affirmative policies. At the same meeting, we get someone else that would say, "It doesn't matter what race they're hiring. What it matters is that they are Malaysian, and that these are the best and brightest." So we we kind of like somehow managed in this past two or three years just to be in that fine line, right? Of not really being told what to do or being asked on how to recruit our kids or anything like that. And then we've also been told, uh, but then we're also being supported by the, just focus on the quality of life. So that's on the teacher's side. Thankfully, nothing going wrong yet. Thankfully, no one has come down and stomped on us yet. Next side of impact in terms of affirmative policy will be the students that we impact. Now, because of this 10,000 bands of schools or rank, right, racial or com racial quotas or, or compositions was not taken into effect. And what we find is that when we go down to schools being Kulakanta, Sri Desa, Sungai Mangis, Sagambot, race is not the issue. It's a class, it's an economic issue that comes into play. That is the biggest differentiator. So you have some schools with like 99% Chinese, in you know, some schools with 99% Malay, um, and we end up sending, because we have so little control with placements of teachers, uh, Ken Ming, who never spoke Mandarin or Chinese before this, was sent to the school. He suffered being called a banana. <laughs> <laughs> um, you then have like Chinese teachers who then end up being sent to a totally Malay school. And similarly, if a Malay teacher is sent, is sent to a totally Chinese school, there was one school which had one Malay, one Chinese, and one Indian teacher, fellows. 
um, and that all the students made fun of them as being sent to Malaysia. Right? Um, so what we find is that the students, they're totally, it doesn't matter what race they are, we still, uh, and we haven't had anyone tell us you have to go to only Malay majority schools. So again, we haven't seen that impact yet in the classroom level. Where I think that might be an impact is um, alumni. So will alumni progress, those that stay in teaching, will they progress based on merit or will they be progressing based on their, with what their racial background is? Thankfully, we have a balance for a good number of Chinese and Malays that stayed on. Um, I don't think none of the Indians, because we have very, very low number of Indian uh, uh, participants or fellows. Uh, so I'm a bit afraid of what alumni would happen with alumni, so that's a big question mark that we're going to have to make sure we get a head off. Um, what are we going to do to solve affirmative action? Or whether we, whether your question was also, yeah. do, do we think affirmative action is the reason why the education system is... I mean, the quality of education, it's, it's, it's sort of stifled or impeded in a sense. Because of the because of yeah. affirmative action? What's your opinion? My personal opinion is like, yeah, um, but I don't know how to solve it. The only way I know how to solve it is get through education. Just making sure that we educate people, anyone, to the best level. Um, the affirmative action also came in from the whole BM was introduced, and then all the English speaking people, uh, English speaking teachers left the system. Um, those only spoke BM were then hired, etc. Right? So you even saw that at the intake of teachers. but. Now I'm also talking, I don't have any concrete data, I don't have any concrete proof, this is just a hunch. Uh, but at the same time, is there benefits to the affirmative action? I'll say yes as well. So it's always a double-edged sword in my, in my point of view. And I really, the teach major is probably not equipped to go down that line to explore that in detail. We just want to stay focused and doing what we can do to show that change is possible convince that one kid, that one classroom, that one school, that change first of all is possible. Because as soon as you change the mindset, everything else opens up after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, no, there's a few other questions. But your question was around reading and funding. Funding, uh, funding is an easy one. Uh, funding, we get 60 per our target, technically we target 60% of the Ministry of Education. 40% uh, from the private sector. And why I'm laughing is because it's so hard to get that 60%. <laughs> um, why we wanted a 60-40 model? Um, again, we wanted to make sure that the Ministry of Education was invested in us. It took us actually two years to set up each major with the Ministry of Education. Never before in the history of Malaysia did an NGO recruit and train teachers. Uh, never before were teachers trained on the basis on such a practical basis as what teach measure espouses to. So only two months of pre-service training and then a lot more support and training that happens throughout the two years. All of those were completely new concepts that we had to syndicate. So to make sure we got complete buy-in, we wanted to get funding from the Ministry of Education. We also wanted to get uh, them to pay for the salaries of the teachers so that we can scale up much faster. Um, we also needed Funding because we weren't sure whether the private sector will actually buy in. Right? Private sector is already paying taxes. And then something on top of this, you have to pay CSR money. The smarter company would say like that's double taxation. Um, the, the, the more chilled out one with a bit more money will actually spend the money on CSR and contributions in that sense. Um, so we're quite lucky um, in that sense and quite thankful because some countries, that, there's 32 partners in the world that's doing this. So can you imagine 32 partners around the world recruiting some of the best and brightest? teach in some of the most underprivileged schools and then creating a movement of alumni leaders uh, in only five years. I think in the next 15 or 20 years, this movement of alumni leaders will be more influential than the United Nations. Uh, that's my 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 that's so that's the sense. Uh, in terms of reading culture, and that can be yeah, so there's a bit like um how to say there's like kind of like a conflict of interest that because in school we we emphasize a lot of reading. We emphasize a lot about being able to um, pick up a book, get a lot of knowledge from it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, even in some of the like challenging areas, a lot of kids are, are in, in the generation that, that reading is not really something that's emphasized at all. Uh, 
uh, specifically because of all the media, all the computers, all the... So my kids, like, you expect them not to be exposed to computers because they come from a poor background. Uh, but I have kids that would work eight weeks continuously over time just to buy a phone, right? And they would buy an S4. And then I have an S4, right? So the kids kind of like, they really, they really crave and hunger for technology. And because of that exposure to technology, they kind of like, are not as invested in school, uh, they're not as invested in reading. So the reading culture is actually a really challenging thing. But we understand, like, some people kind of say like, oh, you can kind of substitute it, you know, by getting like learning modules online and stuff like that. Um, actually, I think you can't, because reading reading is something that, that has to be planted from really, really young, because literacy comes from that. Um, how you use the internet if you don't know how to read, how you kind of like understand law and understand civilization if you don't know how to read well. Um, so we do at a time, one of my students, I had one colleague teach in Malaysia uh, in the time as well, with a form four students, she was actually doing Peter and Jane, right, because that is elementary. So she did one, two, three, four, and within six months, she actually went to like Peter and Jane 12, you know, then all the students are like, yeah, we can do Peter and Jane, but they got SPM next year. Um, so, we sure that the vocabulary was harder in that kind of sense, but you have to start somewhere. And the reading culture, I would say right now, it's, it's not, something, not something that's dead. Um, but there are a lot of people actually like, contributing to this thing, trying to do it. Um, so, there's this guy that, that taught at Sabah, his name is Chelly. Uh, he works in one of the schools, he runs this thing called the Reading Bus. Um, so they have this bus uh, sponsored by Sunway, and they go into rural schools with a whole bunch of books and volunteers, and they read with students. Uh, even some of the fellows, there's a fellow in, in Cementis working together with Ampang, they did a uh, closing the gap program, focusing on literacy and numeracy, where they got volunteers from university, uh, so help university, Taylor's university, or even UK students that come back for holidays, uh, to actually spend um, a couple of weeks with students, right? For, for those in help, they would spend every week so they go every Saturday uh, to read with the kid, read and do numbers, and that helped tremendously because this is not something that is focused in school, right? Because you expect them to be able to read by the time they're from two, but they were already failing back in standard two, right? And, and the system doesn't catch that, so you got to make sure that they kind of catch up. So there are a lot of programs, uh, and that's why we do, we think that the student population, although you're studying all that, um, the contributions that you all can make are actually, you know, coming back to the early question, is actually way more than, than kind of just thinking of what kind of careers. Because during your university life, like we have a lot of university students that actually inspire our students. Uh, we have a few fellows that has friends from all over the world, and all of them write postcards to their to students, telling them about you know where they're studying, what they're doing, and students are just like, teacher, I want to go to Cambridge, and I'm just like, oh, okay, study hard, get learn is, uh, and that kind of thing. So um, this kind of inspiration is necessary, and then coming back to that reading culture. Um, it comes from having more people involved. Because in school, teachers are burdened with, with the syllabus, with the school stuff. Um, and like for instance, I only spend reading with, with one, one or two students that actually came every day after school. Um, I just gave them a book and sat next to him, and while I was doing my work, it was just like, okay, that's wrong, do it again. Uh, and it was just kind of reading with him. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Thanks. You can go to the about summative and how do we measure student outcomes. Okay, so measuring student outcomes, I think for teaching in Malaysia, there's, there's three main ways that we measure. Um, the first one will be achievement, and then there's affect, and then there's access. So achievement will of course be the way we measure benchmark against... Um, so previously when they had the normal grading system, like 100 point ABC, uh, we benchmarked it against one of the top foreign schools in the country, for example, for English, for science, for mathematics. Um, so education, equity, right, is making sure that a student from a poor background or whatever economic background could perform at the same level of someone from like Wesley, Wesley Methodist School or downside of town or VI or whatever. Um, so we did that. But currently, they changed it to that PDS system, which is like school-based assessments. So we do that in the same way. So student, um, student achievement is kind of measured in whatever the government puts as their mark. So now there's um, band 1 to band 6 and the little, little descriptors. Um, so Students being able to achieve between a band four to a band six would be how our teachers assess, right? Uh, for us, because tracking tracking how fellows, you know, kind of make impact in that sense. Uh, the other two parts are the affect and access. So affect works on, which is something that isn't focused so much in school, which is why we put it in as well, um, which, which focuses on character building, right? So for my students at the beginning of the year, uh, I gave them a test on character building. So basically, how they saw themselves. Uh, and how I saw them in terms of things like grit, perseverance, integrity, um, collaboration, and these kind of qualities, right? 
uh, that isn't really accessible in school, and how we then address that is actually in class. A lot of it is culture, right? So working together with your friends, integrity, in being able to um, do the work that you're given, um, is responsibility. And in class, you know, being able to be a leader, uh, go around helping friends, collaboration, all sorts of stuff. So there are different things. Perseverance and how you pick up after you fail. So you're tracking individual students, and at the end of the year, you give uh, a same a same assessment to see whether they have improved uh, in terms of their character building. Uh, and the last one is access. So a student that performs really well, let's say a student is really good in effect, really good in, in achievement, do they know the opportunities that they have? Right? Um, an example is, is someone I was talking to yesterday, he's from Sri Lanka and um, he studied really hard, but he never ever thought he could go to university. Right? Never thought, because that, that just wasn't on his mind at all. So imagine if you don't know what the outcome is, why are you studying? Right? Why are you in school? Why are you pushing yourself? Why are you learning a language and all that? Because my students ask me every day, teacher, what's the point? You know, why am I learning Sajara? Why am I learning geography? And I said, okay, don't ask me that. I'll tell you why you're learning English. Right? <laughs> <laughs> English is important, you know? Um, yeah, so they, they need to understand why. Because there's another level to it, right? Um, a person with a degree is more likely to get a better paying job. Right? That is that is agreed upon. So if a student doesn't believe or doesn't know what options he has after school, um, he doesn't really know why he's studying and he's not motivated. So access is the last part. What sort of opportunities do they know? Um, and the same as the survey, you know, what kind of university opportunities, what sort of if let's say you don't perform really well at school, it's fine, but what sort of vocational opportunities do you think you can get? Um, what do you think you can go? Because you know, you don't want your student to graduate. I had a student in my first year, which is leading on to why I did my project in the second year. In the first year, they got seven A's. And she only knew she got seven A's when she went and got her SPM results, right? Because before that, she thought she would fail. Uh, she thought she would get like two, three A's. So she got seven A's. She had missed matriculation because that's like the year before. Um, so she was thinking about doing uh, thinking about doing STBM, right? But she, had to, she would have to go really far away. Um, and then she was thinking about going to universities, but a lot of the universities had already started in January. It was already March. Um, and applying for scholarships is also a lot harder. Right? You're in like March, you're actually fighting with the next batch of people. Uh, so she didn't know what sort of opportunities she had. Uh, and, and that's a really big point because when you tell your students about why you need to learn English, why you need to study, why you need to like better yourself, you need to kind of show them what the end goal looks like as well. You know, come to Cambridge, it's really beautiful. Or go and study in Australia, or go and study even in University of Malaya, it's a great place. But, you know, dream big for yourself. Because uh, a lot of my students, I would say in Pulau Town, we only have a four percent rate of people that actually go to university, and the rest of them just graduate and whatever job there is, there they just go. So they're working in a restaurant, they're a fisherman, um, random things, and a lot of them, if you ask them, it's not really what they want to do, uh, and that's what we don't want. If you want to become a fisherman, go study fishery, come back and be a super fisherman, right? Run a fishing army. Uh, kind of we want our students to have that kind of dreams. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. So, so uh, just want to jump in. Sometimes the access piece also can actually be the trigger that's actually needed to hit the other two. Yeah. Uh, so, can we give an example about it being an enabler after you get the other two? In some cases, the postcards example, um, got the kids to pay a lot more attention in class and learn English a lot more, because mm -hmm. uh, they then wanted to read all the postcards that were coming into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, that access piece works both ways, uh, both at the end and at the beginning. Uh, there was another element of your question around summative assessments. Uh, we think. Uh, summative, just for you guys, there's two types of assessments that actually happens. Uh, formative assessments to see like how much you're learning. Uh, so these are all the assessments that you get, questions in classrooms. Uh, so if I ask you, like, do you understand what Kimmy just said? Uh, that's not a good formative assessment because you can say yes, but it doesn't tell me anything. But if I ask you, can you name me the three A's that can uh, be mentioned about student outcome? If you guys can, then that's good. That's you now, but, okay, uh, but you can't. So that's formative. Um, summative is at the end of the year after you completed teaching all of that. You then boom, sit down, either regurgitate or higher order thinking in terms of comprehension. Um, and in teach measure, we, we believe both is important. Um, and I think most education practices also recommend uh, research recommends that you need both uh, to actually measure performance in the long run. So next round of questions. Okay, so you started by saying that there is a, uh, a lot of politics and also that they give a lot of excuses to us. 
And uh, he also said that it's a mindset problem. And I see what you're doing, it's great, like um, targeting adopting children, adopting schools even. Because a lot of the examples you hear talk, examples that I know of are really high income, low population countries where they excel at academic. I'm, I'm not really, no, if you do. Are they the rich poor countries? You could, uh, generally, you could share if there is a similar uh, demographic. But my point really is that, is it really a resource issue? Because um, you're talking about scaling up your operations to change nationwide, but you're competing with the same resources that by going to the education ministry. So, you know, I see it's like disconnect over there, and I would like to know, like, and you talk about implementation as the problem with good intentions, right? So really, how do you see yourself playing that role and not actually making the situation worse, or like, um, Ultimately, like what you propose actually adds to the burden of this underpaid, overworked group of people, for teachers. So I, I just have a few clarifying questions so I understand your question correctly. Uh, your first part is like examples from high income nations. I know, that's, that's it. I'm just trying to say, you said earlier that you said resources and you said excuses, mm -hmm. right? So I really view it as a resource problem. Yeah. But so by saying it's an excuse, it's kind of like, yeah, at the beginning, right? Yeah, so I just need to yeah, just be super clear that I understand sure. you. But you think the example of excuses you mean in what sense? No, I'm just saying that you said there's a lot of politics and excuses why it's difficult for change and whatnot. Oh, and right. okay. He among the excuses, I kind of thought I had resources in it, but I think that resources is a fundamental issue yeah. in this whole scheme of things. And you talk about and. I, the other part was that I see your role right now as complementing the existing system. It's like focusing and really drilling students, which is great. But when you talk about doing that for the whole education system, for the whole 95% of the other group, and at the same time you talk about scaling up your operations by depending on resources from the education ministry, I'm worried that you are competing for a scarce resource and whether it will make things worse or add to the burden of existing educators, right? Because new systems and whatnot. So you can call me a skeptic and then this will so be your real question. question. I just wanted to make sure I understood your question first. Like, so the question. Oh hi, um, I have both comments and a question. Yeah? Uh, I didn't get your name. Oh sorry, I have, uh, hi, I'm Yi Hui. I'm from New Zealand. Cool. 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 Yeah. Uh, I have a comment because um, after spending a, whole, a decade in Singapore's education system, I can attest that the system is not without its faults. That's why I find it is quite dangerous to romanticize a system that excels in creating a very ruthlessly efficient system of um, very good students. But the thing I, I personally think that there's a great difference between being able to learn well and being able to study well. And the direction I see Teacher Malaysia going is that it is focused on getting students to perform a lot better exams and in that sense to be much better students instead of generally being inspired to learn about something. Like, you know, like if someone's inspired to learn something, it'd be much easier to get them from failures to maybe an A plus than trying to force feed them like group exam papers that everyone has force fed them, no matter how smart or brilliant the teacher may be. And that's why my question is that how do we how can teach from Malaysia help in creating better not just better students but better learners? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi I'm Adrian and my question is somewhat related to so, uh, do you see anything wrong with like, the, the syllabus of our education right now? And is there anything you're doing to change that so that maybe like we can be like like she said like learners rather than just like absorbing everything? Sure. Uh, let me have to go first. <laughs> uh, I'll start with Kogan's question. Um, Again, resource, you mean talent resource or money resource? Financial, okay, fair. Um, in that sense, teaching major in terms of scaling up doesn't mean like a teach major fellow will be will be in every classroom. Okay? Um, so again, the reason why we focus on leaders is that we want to actually hit a few key levers, um, either principals, teacher training colleges, uh, policy makers, uh, that would one day set the curriculum, etc. Uh, so we actually want to have, uh, if you like to compare it to a, a business organization, it's a bit more of a fast-track uh, 
career development <coughs> system, which right now like many many companies have a management training program, etc. And then they then put that those that perform well in the management training then goes on a more fast track system within the business. So what we try to do is we try to create something similar in the education space. Now the ministry also has ideas to create a fast track merit based career progression, but I, we don't know where exactly it is. But we're just starting with the first two years at least. Get that right first. So in terms of resources, yes, we're competing with probably teacher training resources, um, but then it's not like we're taking a big pie away. Like our, the numbers we're, we're putting in is like we're targeting 120 for the next cohort, uh, while the ministry trains 10,000 a year. Um, so in that sense, I don't think we're, we're ever going to reach that scale, uh, but we hope that some of our practices would be transferred to teacher training colleges. So don't train a teacher send them to pull out the thumb and then just expect the principal to take care of it. The teacher or the new teacher that's been trained actually needs a lot more support in their first two years to get that going. And that's something that any teacher training college or the school can adopt. Like, we're not shy about we're not sh we're not shy about keeping that as a secret. Like that's actually some an open secret that we share and we recommend over and over. Um, and then that, that's where the politics comes in a bit as well, right? Like if that recommendation is put forward why isn't someone thinking about taking it up? Why is there hesitance? Um, and that's something I don't know um, why that stops. I mean, my point of view would be, is that the right model to go? Because if you talk about management, I don't know, management training, you know, talk about companies which are competing against one another to excel and be the top and defeat their competitors. You're talking about education system, you're talking about all schools and you have this high competition. And you know how always the implementation is where the problem is. So is that the model that would work? Well, I don't think uh, competition prevents the implementation from working. Um, I think the implementation is a factor of the talent that, you tr that is running the system. Um, so if you have a team, so again, uh, another example of how PBS, right? Like it, it formed in a lot of different schools, but it's actually a trust school program uh, that's being running right now. Um, that's modeled after the charter school system in the US, academies in the in UK. Uh, trust, trust, trust schools are a bit more privately managed and they have a bit more expertise that's coming in to coach the principals and teachers. So they actually implemented PBS at a much higher level and a much higher adoption rate. So this has nothing to do with teaching major, uh, but then in terms of quality of talent, they made sure they focus on the quality of talent of the teachers so that the teachers were well equipped, well skilled, PBS. Um, so that's the implementation part. Now the comp so I'm separating out the implementation and the competition. So implementation is a factor of the talent or the skill sets. The competition part is needed. You need competition no matter what, um, whether it's about making money or whether it's about educating kids. Um, because if you don't have that competition, what's, what's going to drive people to where, where's the bar? Like, and how, how are you going to push that bar forward? But how you treat that competition and how you incentivize competition that's a dangerous part. Um, in the sense that you do need to make sure you weed out the low performing ones that are not meeting the bars at all, bad minimums. But I'm not talking about the bar of excellence. Uh, and then you, with the people that reach that bar of excellence, you need to then make sure you use that talent to spread out that innovation and thing so that that innovation is not just shared. Because compet in that sense, that's where competition becomes bad, right? It becomes a bit bad in an open system like Malaysia for the education system, you don't want just a few schools becoming really powerful and then not sharing with others. So the Shanghai system actually has a very strong peer learning culture where strong principles have to adopt five other principles that are either raising up to the bar at different performance levels. So that's where you get around the performance because uh, around the competition. So you add, the competition helps you identify who's the best principle um, but then you have an equal system and mechanism to make sure that the best principle then shares it out across the board. May I interject a little bit? Sure. Well, because uh, in Singapore, like, they, they have this famous bell curve theory where they say it doesn't like, I think we're supposed to this goal, and when people freak out during the exams, they say, don't worry, you have to eat other percent to like, cushion the bell curve, so you're kind. It's terrible, it's mean, but I think what is also very unhealthy because it assumes that growth is linear. And it also assumes that it is constant and fixed. So I think like when we talk about the performance, like high performance or excellence, as something that's measurable or something that is quantifiable, it's actually quite dangerous <coughs> because it not only limits everyone's individual potential, it also very narrows like the 
And I think that's also a bad way. I think that's a that's a good example of a bad way of looking at performance. I don't know because like I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with teaching people, but I know that when I sometimes mentor like friends of other students, I think it's very important to like, focus on their personal experiences as um, your career mentioned, and not so much on the quantifiable bars of excellence that our ministers are trying to push for. Yeah, which which. Uh, which I'll like to um, segue to your, your question earlier on, right? It was in terms of like, is teaching major than creating just people that want to learn? And that was the first A that can be mentioned, achievement. But you cannot get that first A unless you get the other two A's, right? Access and effect. Access to the kids actually know what opportunities out there to inspire them to learn. The postcards, the, the visits to KLCC. Some of the kids living an hour away have not even been to KLCC. Um, effect in terms of their character strength. All of that, right, is important, and you actually, we, they have, fellows actually handle that a lot more. Uh, they drill that, they drill classroom culture a lot more, investment a lot more than the actual achievement. Uh, but once you get that right, and if you get that right, it's really important, but doors are not going to open up to you in the existing system if you don't have the achievement results. Uh, and if you don't have the achievement results, all that, all that, the stuff that they learn about, like, oh, um, all this confidence, etc., it doesn't pay off. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't get reinforced. So, the examination results, like it or not, in the end of the day, do two things. They open up doors for the kids, and number two, they reinforce the, two, the first two things character and access and inspiration. Because the kids only say, oh, I can do well at the 61% or the C. Plus. You think he's suddenly going to say, like, if he didn't get that C, plus, would he then, would it be hammered home into his head that actually, Hard work is needed to succeed. He might be always thinking, oh, it's only about coming. It's either I am good at English or I'm not. But that true hard work, constant work, constant practice, I don't think he actually gave a sample paper to actually read, but more like subject, verb, verb, object, object. Yeah, subject, verb, object. Yeah. Subject, verb, object, that, that actually created that whole emphasis that in the end of the day, you focus on the character strength, you focus on the access, achievement results. So if you got a D or an E or an F after doing all of that, you won't reinforce those other things. So it actually becomes a virtuous loop that goes up. Coming back to that point about learners versus like, like just driven for results. Um, like why why we focus on certain things? Um, and, I, and I'll actually say that there's a lot of things we do focus on in the classroom. Um, we actually focus to make sure that they become independent learners um, because we're only there for two years. Right, um, and then the way I kind of so let's say young half, for instance, um, drilling him is is what I can say that I do in the class, um, but the things that I use to drill him are actually totally different. So I have a classroom management system that says, okay, guys, we need to work together. Everybody has to be ready. Everybody has to have their books out before we actually start doing anything. So they kind of push each other, and that's that's kind of like an affect thing as well, right? And then coming to access, um, we at the beginning of the year we always have things um, that ask about your child's ambition. Uh, we make that like a driving factor. So I know that Yongha wants to be a graphic designer, right? Because he specifically told me. And knowing that as well, I said, what do you need to be a graphic designer? You need to get a minimum, you need to pass SPM, right? If you're going to study a diploma in graphic design, you have to pass SPM. Uh, and to pass SPM, what do you need? By the time he gets to SPM, Sajara will be better to you as well, right? Uh, and what do you need to be a graphic designer? To be a graphic designer, you need to know English because if not, you don't know anything in business, right? Um, so there are things that actually drive them. Um, and I think a lot of, I would say that the skills that you used to get, like what Zamir said, getting that 61 um, opens that door that he says now it's possible because it had never been possible before. Uh, and I think you have to have that. Um, you have to have, I think it is, you have to have a benchmark. You have to have a sort of a ruler to see that you're not just, you're not just like, I don't know, for instance for teachers, you know, I'm just teaching a whole bunch of stuff and I don't know what my new students achieve, right? Uh, you have to have a ruler. And that ruler actually is coming back to some of the assessments uh, to tell you that your student got from here to here. Now, if you look at here to here, uh, in a sense, I wouldn't only consider it linear because linear is the academic part. All right, so coming to Cambridge studying is the academic part. That's linear, right? But in getting involved in something like this, teaching that is not linear uh, because that develops leadership, that develops your potential to start your own uh, teaching major or become a fellow or do something else. Um, and that's, you know, things like co-curricular and stuff like that. 
Um, so there has to be a linear, so there is a skeleton. Um, but what we do in the classroom actually emphasizes a whole lot of different things. Like, why do we take kids to KLCC? That's not going to get them an A. But that shows them what, you know, what the city looks like, what Malaysia has achieved, what you can achieve, you know, kind of exposure, you know. Um, so making students independent learners are actually a really big focus. Um, and we drive that through having results as well. Because if you are independent learners without results, it's not really possible. Okay, so just to ground on it, there's a lot of the steps that we're taking on focusing on are for kids from low-income communities that have not succeeded. I don't think the same can be applied for the elite schools that you're talking about because there's a totally different culture um, that, that you're, you're giving an account of. Well. So, and your question was around syllabus. Yeah. Like, what are we doing to change it? Or do you, do you see anything wrong with it? Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's three pillars, right, when it comes to student learning. Our syllabus, teaching, and examination and assessments. Uh, so actually, our syllabus actually is very strong in Malaysia. It's not something considered to be the best. The only problem I'll say with it right now, our syllabus is not designed. It's a bit too much in a given year, uh, given all the other activities that are put into place. So the syllabus is not put into context, if you like. I'll probably make it a bit more contextual, like spread it out, make it a bit lighter. Um, what happens is that the assessments are actually poorly designed. So the assessments only probably touch maybe 50, 60, 40% of the syllabus. So the teachers end up only teaching that 40 to 60% because they're teaching to the test, uh, not to the syllabus itself. Um, so that's the missing piece. What are we doing to change it? Right now, nothing, but I hope Alumni will do it if you're interested. <laughs> um, why not? You know, um, stay on and then you will get teaching experience, and then move into the curriculum or examination board department, etc., and then make the necessary changes. But again, those, those, it's more of around those three things as well. So, um, all right. I think we have to bring the questions to an end. Um, but don't worry, we have the room until seven, and there are questions at the back, so you can come up and talk to Zamir and Ken individually. So, uh, right now, you join me to thank Zamir and Ken for being here.